Good evening and welcome on behalf of Crossroads Cultural Center. This is the inaugural 2016 Albacete Lecture on Faith and Culture, and thank you for your participation. A very special thanks to the Sheen Center for hosting us. We could not start this first lecture without briefly remembering the man who gave his name to it, Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete. To do that, we are truly blessed to have a very close longtime friend of Monsignor who flew from Puerto Rico to be with us tonight to honor his memory. Let's give a very warm welcome to His Eminence, Roberto Gonzalez, Archbishop of San Juan. Good evening. Uh, Monsignor Lorenzo had a very unique way of saying things, and he had a wonderful sense of humor, which I lack. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of beginning with a story, and I couldn't think of one until maybe five seconds ago. And so I'll begin with this story, but then I would like to use um, Lorenzo's own words so that Lorenzo can speak to us this evening and then conclude with a brief prayer. Well, many years ago, before John Paul II was uh, Pope, he was Archbishop of Krakow, Karol Wojtyla, and he visited Washington, D.C. At that time, Lorenzo was Cardinal Baum's theological advisor. And Cardinal Baum asked uh, Lorenzo to take Cardinal Wojtyla and give him a tour of Washington. And Lorenzo took him to um, uh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> because that was one of Lorenzo's favorite places. <laughs> and so Lorenzo and the Cardinal of Krakow um, had some Kentucky Fried Chicken and he showed him around D.C. And when Cardinal Wojtyla returned to um, Poland, he sent a note to Lorenzo thanking him. And I never saw the note, but Lorenzo told me that in the note, the Cardinal had asked Lorenzo a question or two, and Lorenzo never responded. Several months passed, and then Cardinal Wojtyla wrote another letter to Lorenzo, to which he never responded. Lorenzo never. Then when uh, Cardinal Wojtyla was elected Pope, um, Lorenzo obviously went to Rome and congratulated him, and, and the Pope said to him, well, will you answer my letters now? <laughs> now that I'm Pope. Well, most of us in this room, if not all of us, um, were alive during the tragic events of September 11th. And after those tragic events, Lorenzo was interviewed by, the light is rather poor here, <laughs> by Frontline. And I have a copy of the interview here and I thought it would be appropriate to, he was interviewed by Helen Whitney in the winter of 2002. So with your indulgence, give me about five minutes to read um, some of Lorenzo's responses to the questions that were posed to him in that interview regarding September 11. The question, what was September 11 like for you? Lorenzo, I saw death. I saw death. I am a priest. I've seen many kinds of deaths, many deaths. Death of young people, death of old people. Peaceful deaths. People just fly off. Tragic deaths as a result of accidents, of violence even. I've seen death resisted till the last minute, agonizing death. But this was different. This was death. 
death. In each death, I have to be personally engaged because, as you know, I don't want it to sound selfish, but you know, I don't, but you experience, you anticipate. I anticipate my own possibility of ceasing to exist. I hate it. I'm against it. Every fiber, mentally, physically, fights against it. Each death is a horror, but finally it's over. There is some kind of closure, some kind of sign that says, well, move on. This was absent on September 11. Just to see the inevitable scene again and again and again of that plane. And was it because they showed it again and again? No, no because I felt it the first time. Namely, there is no closure. This doesn't say to me, move on. It says, stay. Stay and look. Stare into this black hole. Don't go away because this is going to change you. And I knew, and I knew it from the very first moment, this was not the same. This was death in all its nakedness, death. The question, as a priest, were you comforted by your faith? Lorenzo, as I looked at that scene of horror, the people jumping, the people running away, the building falling, the flames, the explosions, was I consoled in some way by my faith that I was here seeing the passage to another kind of life? No, no, a thousand times no. I didn't even think of it. I had to see it. I was dominated, ceased by the event, that's all. No interpretation, no consolation, just the reality, later, Later, the question emerges and faith comes in, but not at that moment, no. The question. The image of the man and the woman who held hands as they jumped from the window, do you think about where they might be? Monsignor Lorenzo. I think they are in the hands of the love that is the ultimate reality about human life the love of which those two hands held together as they jumped from the window, the love of which those two hands are a revelation, a sign, a brief insight. I think they are there. It doesn't matter how one imagines it. Imagine it the way you want. That's the great thing about it, the way you want but they're holding hands. To me, that image is an inescapable provocation. This gesture, this holding of hands in the midst of that horror, it embodies what September 11 was all about. The image confronts us with the need to make a judgment, a choice. Does it show the ultimate hopelessness of human attempts to survive the power of hatred and death? Or is it an affirmation of a greatness within our humanity itself that somehow shines in the midst of that darkness and contains the hint of a possibility, a power greater than death itself? Which of the two? It's a choice. It's the choice of September 11. The question, what did you learn about evil, Lorenzo? As a priest, I deal with good and evil all the time. Well, first of all, as a human being, I live good and evil all the time within me. As a priest, it's my business. I hear confessions. I give spiritual advice. I deal with moral issues all the time. So each time I recognize myself 
in all sides of the problems that come to me in human situations. And as an intellectual, as a theologian, I study it. I have read the history of the great debates about what is good and what is evil. How are these related throughout the history of thought? Great issues, great problems, all of that. But 9-11 was different. This was a reality present, something about it that was different. And I thought, what can it be? Is it the magnitude of this or the number of people, the explosion, the drama of it? Was it the incessant looking at it on television? No, no. I tried all these things, but there was more. There was more I had to pay attention to. I thought, take the Holocaust, for example, from the point of view of magnitude and of horror. In that sense, it's unimaginable. And yet, Hitler at least hated a concrete people. He hated the Jews. He wanted to destroy the Jews. In fact, in order to somehow make it possible, he had to deny their humanity so he could wipe them out. But here, there were Jews present, there were Christians, there were Buddhists, there were atheists, there were Muslims, there were rich, there were poor, there were CEOs, there were waiters, there were newlyweds, there were widowers, it was humanity. The Twin Towers, the whole region is an affirmation of human dreams, of human ambition, of human desire, of the hope of human progress, of human struggle for, desire, for survival. It's humanity, and that had to be destroyed because this was hatred for humanity that inspired this deed. I don't know the people who did this, how they rationalized it or explained it away. It's beside the point. I was watching hatred for humanity. I am human too. I was in those buildings. We were all in those buildings, being human beings. And this was the depth of it. If I thought what we saw on September 11th, the dreadful and horrible possibilities of religion were the only face of religion, I assure you I'd take off this collar. There is another face, maybe harder to see after September 11 and what, was, and what has followed it, but it's there. I see it every Sunday. The parish where I work is not far from the World Trade Center, which is near here. The Lower East Side, 90% Hispanic, poor people, many affected by death in the World Trade Center. And yet they weren't asking the great difficult questions about why or the nature of evil. They don't have time for that. They have to struggle to live every day. And in that struggle, which somehow embraced even that terrible day, their religion, their church, their parish stands for life, stands for hope, stands for home. It sustains them. It helps them. It's not their opium, <coughs> as Marx would say. On the contrary, it encourages them to struggle, not to give up, not to surrender, they are poor, but they know, they experience, they feel that each one of them has a link with an infinite mystery. No need to worship any other source of power, economic power, political power, that they have a dignity that cannot be taken away from them. I mean, in, Amer in Latin America, which is my ethnic background, the religion has been the force that has sustained the drive for justice and liberty of millions. I mean, their statues, Our Lady, and so forth. It's because no matter how poor, no matter how weak, they have come to believe and experience it. 
Each one of them has a link with the infinite, with that very same mystery in the name of which people kill and hate. They experience that link, that mystery, as the source of their dignity and of the dignity of others. And when people disappear, their loved ones, when death occurs, they imagine them resting in the arms of that mystery of absolute love. That's my daily fare. I see that every day. I see it within hours of the World Trade Center. Everybody saw something of it on television. Time has passed since September 11, 2001, and life has returned to normal only that the normal now contains still as an open wound, an open window into mystery. What happened that day, those bodies, fire, the airplanes crashing relentlessly again and again, the people running away, the horror in their faces of those who were seeing this, all of that in the name of God, the very same God which but a few blocks away was sustaining the hope and the courage of my parishioners, the poor Hispanics of the Lower East Side. They too were appealing to God, appealing to God to console me. They were ministering to me. And since then until now, forever, I'll be faced with those two faces of God, two faces of the mystery, what I what I have to choose. I hope I have the friends and support of people who would stop me if they see me ever moving into the direction that may open the slightest bit of the door to God of destruction and hatred. Which is the true face of religion? I keep asking myself, which is the true face of religion? I don't think there are two gods. I think there is only one God. Which is the true face of God? Well, I don't know. I only know this. I will never worship a God that doesn't reveal itself as humility, as poor. That's how I have changed. And I hope I will be faithful to it until it's my turn to disappear into the mystery. I thank those of you who have um, organized this event and th these series of, of conferences in memory of Lorenzo, Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete. We thank God for the gift that he was to so many people who knew him in this life. I pray that this series of conferences over the years will help to keep alive among many of us uh, the depth, the beauty, the wonder, the dignity of his life, of his memory, of his quest for understanding. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Thank you very much, Archbishop. Monsignor Albacete chaired the Crossroads Advisory Board from its establishment in 2007 until he passed away almost two years ago on October 24th, 2014. In establishing and running a Catholic cultural center, he always warned us against focusing on a predetermined subset of issues, people, or ideas that would fall under the Catholic label. On the contrary, to him, being a Catholic cultural center meant precisely the opposite. That is, to be interested in everything at a 360-degree angle. 
in one of his memorable addresses to the advisory board, which are now all collected in a small volume that you can find at the exit, he said, why should a Catholic cultural center be, prom be promoting things just because they are interesting? Because this is our redemption, salvation. This is what Christ has come to do, to revive, to give life to our interest so that we can recognize his victory and therefore our victory over those forces that diminish us, that reduce the experience of our dignity, that reduce even the range of our reason and of our desires. The only thing that can break through that shell constructed around our inner selves, our heart, by this culture of death, the only way to break through is with the power of the interesting. In order to honor his memory, to deepen his profound intuitions about the interaction of culture with religiosity and reason, and to follow his shining, shining example of dialogue with people in various walks of life by meeting them at the level of human experience, we have established the Albacete Lecture on Faith and Culture. Its goal is to become an annual event and a meeting place, a crossroads, where we may develop an understanding of why culture matters and where it's, it finds its origin and sustenance. Tonight, we could not have a better person to help us in this goal than Professor Remy Brog. We are deeply honored and fortunate to have with us one of the most knowledgeable scholars in the world in the history of Western culture. Professor Brog is a French philosopher who has written on all periods of the history of philosophy from Plato to Heidegger and Leo Strauss. He is Professor Emeritus of Medieval and Arabic Philosophy at the Sorbonne in Paris, and he's held the R Romano Guardini Chair of Philosophy at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. He is a member of the Institut de France Academy of Moral and Political Sciences. You can read his very impressive biography in the program, but let me just underline that Professor Brog is the author of more than 20 books, most recently, L'Oreigne de l'Homme, on the genesis and failure of the project of modernity that the human being creates himself. His books are translated into numerous languages, especially into English. He has also written hundreds of academic articles on classical and medieval intellectual history, religion, national identity, literature, and law. He is the recipient of numerous awards and has been a visiting professor <clears throat> at Boston College, Boston University, Penn State University, Rice University, and many other academic in institutions around the world. We are very grateful to have him. We are very grateful that he's accepted to give this inaugural lecture. So please, let's give a warm welcome to Professor Remy Brog. Well, introducing a lecturer is a literary genre in itself. You don't have to take it too seriously. <laughs> what I did take seriously was the invitation and the honor bestowed on me to uh, give a lecture in this prestigious place, and especially a lecture which is devoted to the memory of a man who most obviously was larger than life, and I do regret that I could not meet him in the flesh. Well, as far as the topic of the present lecture is concerned, I was given <clears throat> some hints about uh, what my talk should deal with. And I quote literally what I found in my mailbox. The origin, relevance, and aim of Christian culture in light of the address of Pope Benedict XVI at the Collège de Bernardin. This is quite a tall order. Well, 
I will do my best. <laughs> and let me begin with a personal remembrance. I actually was in Paris on September the 12th, 2008, and I had the privilege of attending Pope Benedict's lecture. The elite of the Parisian intelligentsia was there and its predicament was huge. To judge by the puzzled expression of their faces, those big shots most probably could not make heads or tails of it. What was the Pope driving at? What was the upshot of this meditation on monkish life in the Middle Ages, i.e. on a walk of life which is not ours, Moreover, which belong to a historical period that is not ours and has been, for many of us, given good riddance to. I must confess that my humble self in person understood only a little bit of what the Pope was telling us. I had to read the text of his lecture more than once and for the last time in order to prepare the present lecture. Let me now endeavor better to take advantage of Benedict's insights. I will take my bearings from a working definition of culture which badly needs refining. Culture is the set of the answers to the basic questions of mankind, be they humdrum or lofty. Whom shall I marry? What shall I eat? And how shall I cook my meals? How shall I behave with my social and natural surrounding? Whom shall I worship? In each case, a culture distinguishes a right and a wrong behavior, hence what we call values. What we call a culture or a civilization is a definite set of answers that distinguish a right way and the wrong one. Thou shalt marry a person belonging to this group and not have incestual commerce. Thou shalt eat this food and not that disgusting filth. Thou shalt worship this God of ours and not that foreign idol, and so on and so forth. Moreover, we must distinguish two sets of elements in which we tell our right way from the wrong way of the others. Some deal, <coughs> some <coughs> deal with the very foundations of human life. The life of the individual with food, clothing, etc. Or the survival of the group with marriage and education. Now, culture in this meaning is hardly common parlance. It is rather a word of art used by anthropologists. There is, in culture, something else which is not strictly necessary. And this is, for the most part, what we, common people, usually call by the name of culture. For instance, art, religion, philosophy, and science. Let us call this higher culture. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, made an important point about this kind of culture for which he chooses, for obvious reasons, the example of philosophical pursuits, summarized in the searching for causes. Aristotle observes that such an endeavor can arise only after, after basic needs have been met by various arts. He further points out that it requires a leisure class. And he gives as example the priests in Egypt who had nothing very much to do, apart, as a matter of course, from the ritual deeds that were their job, and those people invented geometry. What the Greek philosopher tells us from Athens was taught in Jerusalem, too. Let me now have a look at the Bible and read a satire on the origin of idolatry, which is to be found in the second part of the book of the prophet Isaiah. The passage is meant as lampooning idolatry, as poking fun 
and the stupidity of people who adore dumb and powerless statues of wood and stone. The theme is hackneyed in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim apologists. It is even trite in the so-called pagan authors, like the Latin poet Horace, who, unlike the bitter mood of Isaiah, contents himself with an indulgent smile. In Isaiah, the sculptor had first cooked his meal and warmed himself with the wood, a part of which he is about to sculpt into a god. The prophet has the idol monger say, Oh, I warm myself and I look at the flame. The sentence is at first sight rather redundant and could very well be overlooked. Yet it expresses two important ideas. The first one is reflexivity, knowing what one does. I warm myself. I know that I warm myself. The second idea is the aesthetic moment. Fire is not only a way for us to warm our bodies or to roast meat and boil vegetables. Fire has a beauty of its own. And we can spend long hours of daydreaming while contemplating the burning logs of an open fire in a chimney. A very important word is uttered by the author of the biblical satire on idolatry that I have quoted. The idol is made out of what is left, she'erit, of the wood. This teaches us an important point. Culture is basically superfluous. A word that is more often than not taken with a derogatory shade of meaning, yet... Its etymology teaches us something important, overflowing. This is the first sense in which I claim that culture is a byproduct. Human beings can get interested in things that are not useful for their own sake. We need not look at the flame in order to feel its warmth. This property we find in some things we call beauty. In beauty, two meanings of interest clash against each other. Interest can designate what pays off, like the interests of a loan. But we know that what is interesting can exist beyond or even in the teeth of what is useful for us. Beauty is lovable. But the love of beauty is of a special kind. It doesn't aim at getting its object, but it keeps the distance that enables enjoying by contemplating. This is nicely captured by the word amateur, from the Latin amare, to love, but with a shade of meaning of some, some detachment. Now, being an amateur, is a specifically human feature. To quote C.S. Lewis, man is the only amateur animal. All the others are professionals. They have no leisure and do not desire it. When God made the beasts dumb, he saved the world from infinite boredom. For if they could speak, they would all of them, all day, talk nothing but shop. <laughs> this presence of an aesthetic sense in primitive mankind receives a powerful confirmation from recent discoveries of paleontologists. They report the discovery in some prehistoric tombs of some weird artifacts like primitive axes or knives, the so-called bifaces, or simply the discovery of spheres made of flint, chert, or basalt. Those objects were very carefully wrought, i.e. at the cost of many hours of labor. But they never were used for a practical purpose. On the cutting edge of the bifaces of those primitive axes, there is no trace of use, and no tear and wear on the surface of those perfect spheres. 
they may have had a cultic purpose. They may have been a gift of sorts to uh, the deceased, but this is anybody's guess. In any case, those objects give evidence of some aesthetic sense in very ancient times. This dimension of culture, this is what you have just been, been <coughs> seeing, was highlighted by the Greeks, Aristotle, as well as by ancient Israel, Isaiah. They concur in a common matter, even if they express it in different styles, conceptual for the Greeks, narrative for the Jews. Now, this feature, being a byproduct, holds good for culture in general. What about Christian culture? The question deserves to be asked all the more that this Christian culture is often described as blending Greek and Jewish elements, as hailing both from Athens and Jerusalem, either taking after both or building a fruitful tension between those two poles. Let me now have a look at this specific case and to begin with, at the example chosen by Pope Benedict. The example he puts at the center of his meditation is, as I observed at the outset, rather surprising. Monastic life in the Middle Ages. According to Pope Benedict, the intention of the medieval monks was definitely not to create culture, not even to preserve an earlier culture. Now, it is the case that they splendidly achieved what they didn't want. Benedict is eager to remind his hearers of this feat, but he simply mentions it en passant as a side issue. Let me briefly expand his allusion. Monks succeeded in preserving the legacy of classical Latin literature. This happened in troubled times, when the very survival of ancient culture in the Latin West was at stake. A watershed is the death of Boetius in 524, five years before another watershed, before the events that led to the closure of the school of Athens, of the philosophical school of Athens, by the Emperor Justinian. Boethius, a patrician of old stock was among the very few Romans who had kept a good knowledge of Greek. Now, precisely because of the ebb of Greek knowledge in the West, he felt the need for a translation of the Greek philosophers of the Socratic tradition. He therefore endeavored to translate Plato and Aristotle and to comment upon both of them. He could not fulfill his vast project, for accused of a secret correspondence with the emperors of Constantinople, who already were planning to conquer again the western part of the empire, he was thrown to jail, where he wrote his masterpiece, The Consolation of Philosophy, and he was finally put to death. Boetius was not a monk, however. But one generation later, in 555, another Roman nobleman, Cassiodorus, attempted something in very much the same lines when he founded in Calabria, i.e. the last tip of the Italian peninsula, the toes of the riding boot, when he founded the convent of Vivarium, whose exact location is still unknown to archaeology. This convent harbored, at the same time, a large library in which manuscripts were not only kept and read, but copied, hence preserved. Interestingly, Cassiodorus very consciously imitated the convent of Nisibis at the northern border of present-day Iraq, a convent which harbored also a school in which the language of teaching was Syriac. The whole network of Benedictine abbeys, which spread all over Western Europe, was instrumental in our still having at our disposal Latin literature, in spite of the vanishing of the Western Roman Empire. In a word, monks hardly contented themselves 
with singing vespers in the temple of Jupiter amidst the ruins of the Capitol in front of Edward Gibbon. Those monks were powerfully and efficiently instrumental in helping ancient culture over the gap that had opened between the ancient world and what was to become the so-called Middle Ages. What is especially interesting is that those monks did not throw a boy to or build a raft for Christian literary castaways only. The bulk of what they helped climb on board was pagan literature. Among pagan authors, some, to be sure, could be kind of baptized post-mortem. Virgil could be read as a prophet of sorts because of the long misinterpretation of the fourth eglogue. And Seneca was believed to have had a correspondence with St. Paul. But why did the monks keep the historians of the bawdy Catullus, of the lewd Ovid, let alone Lucretius, the Epicurean atheist? All this was made possible by what I called elsewhere the Pauline Revolution, St. Paul's Revolution. It drew a wedge between paganism and Judaism. On the one hand, Greek paideia, what we call at present by the name of Greek culture, was a package deal of sorts. It included what we would call highbrow literacy as the epics by Homer. It included to sport at the palestra. Finally, last and certainly not least, it included sacrifices to the civic gods too, i.e. religion. Tragedy arose as part and parcel of the feasts of the god Dionysus. Even the philosophers were organized as cult guilds. We still call the places in which we keep what we consider to be precious museums, which means temples of the muses. Roman education led a stress on military prowess and evolved into a cult of the emperor as embodying the legitimacy of Roman rule over the Mediterranean. Thus far, pagan culture. On the other hand, Jewish scholars at the time of St. Paul already planned to extract from the Torah a whole system of rules, the way of life, in Hebrew, halakha. In principle, the same as the later Islamic Sharia, it was meant to provide, in principle, ready answers to whatever question about what is to be done in any situation. By this token, pagans, as well as Jews, had full-fledged systems of culture. Now Paul brought about a sea change. He severed culture from religion over against the Greek paideia and the Jewish halacha. The Torah had to undergo a severe slimming cure. Of the 613 commandments that it contains, Paul kept only the Decalogue in its literal sense and interpreted the other ones as allegories. Now, the halacha, as I just been saying, was supposed to answer whatever question could be asked on how to behave in all the circumstances of daily life. As a consequence, in front of the problem of the good life, the Christian believer was left empty-handed barring some very general moral principles. He had to look elsewhere for precise guidelines. And this elsewhere was found in many places. To begin with, the Roman polity, together with the law that regulated it, and Greek philosophy were drawn upon. But both 
had lost their religious underpinnings. Pagan culture became only what we call today culture. It entered a Christian framework without losing its specificity. In my vocabulary, pagan culture was not digested, but included. When Christianity entered the scene of the ancient world, the content of the framework was what happened to be available in the market of ancient Greek or Roman civilization, i.e. law, philosophy, etc. But the same framework could very well be filled by other contents. Later on, Germanic and Slavic mores, Celtic legends, Arabic and Persian lore and science entered the melting pot. The Jesuit missionaries didn't object to letting Chinese mores into it in the 17th century. But their attempt, as is well known, regrettably failed. In the future, this failure might prove to have been only provisional, let us hope. In any case, we meet here a paradox. Christian culture is not made of Christian elements. Let us now come back to the observation made by Pope Benedict. The monks never dreamed, dreamt of doing something cultural, let alone of building a Christian culture or civilization. Some may even have thought that their doings and works of their making were doomed to disappear in a more or less near future. But this didn't prevent them from buzzing themselves with preservation or furtherance of cultural goods and even with innovation. A good example is Pope Gregory the Great, who died in 604. Pope Gregory led the foundations for the whole Middle Ages. Not so much because of the Gregorian chant, which was named after him in both meanings of the phrase, but rather as the last of the forefathers of the Latin Church, as the author of a long commentary on the book of Job, which was the first comprehensive treatise on morals written by a Christian, not to mention the many reforms he brought about in ecclesiastical life. Now, people were convinced that the end was at hand, and he, Gregory, shared this feeling. He was almost sure to be the last pope, or the last but one. He simply wanted to put things away, in the same way as we clean up our house, sweep the carpets, water the plants, feed the goldfish, and so on, before leaving for a weekend. To some extent, the monks were no exception. They were rather the heirs to a millennia-long tradition that hails back to pre-Christian times. For the most part, the objects which our museums are full of were not meant to hang somewhere on the walls of a museum or to lie in a show window. They were meant either to lighten the burden of mankind or to please the gods. Yet, the monks who salvaged ancient culture without their knowing that they were salvaging ancient culture, were at least conscious of a fact. There exists between Christianity and culture a link at the same time paradoxical and powerful. This link can be described as a mutual need. Mutual, but not symmetric. On the one hand, Christianity needs as its content culture any culture that it has not to produce directly. On the other hand, culture needs Christianity as its ground. In what follows, I will develop those two points. And first of all, we remember the paradox. Christian culture is not made of Christian elements. Now, this is the flip side of another surprising fact, Christianity never claimed to produce a full-fledged culture. Huge chunks of human experience are left outside of the pale 
and entrusted to human intelligence. Human intelligence, which was created, to be sure, by divine grace, but unaided by a special revelation. This distinguishes Christianity from other religions. For instance, there is in Judaism a Talmudic cuisine based on the rules of kashrut. There are Christian cooks, but there is no Christian cuisine. There is in Islam a so-called prophetic medicine based on the pieces of advice given by Muhammad in some cases and summarized in some collections of hadith which have this name, prophetic medicine. This is the title of some books. There are Christian physicians, but there is no Christian medicine. There is in Islam an Islamic dress code, the Islamic veil for each grown-up female, the commandment to let one's beard grow and trim one's mustachio for each male. There are Christian tailors and Christian hairdressers, but there is no Christian fashion. In a nutshell, there is no such thing as a specifically Christian behavior. There is no desire on the side of Christians to live their concrete, everyday lives apart from other people. This is already what is pointed out in a remarkable early document of Christian apologetics, the famous, albeit anonymous, Tu Diognetis. This work probably hails back to the end of the second century, i.e. shortly before 200. Christians, so the unknown author of the epistle to Diognetus, Christians don't distinguish themselves from other people by a special abode, by a special language, by a special attire, or a special diet. This has taken a fresh actuality since our Western countries have been confronted with a militant Islam for which clothes and food have a religious dimension. There shouldn't be either any intellectual yearning to claim some specificity for cultural achievements. More important, and perhaps more provocative and more difficult to swallow, there is no Christian morals Contrary to a common way of speaking, there is a common morality, what C.S. Lewis, once again, called the Tao, or the Great Platitudes. And there is a Christian understanding of this common morality. Too many people imagine that Christian mores can be put on the same level as folklore. Quaint foreign people have quaint ways so charming, so interesting for tourists who see them from the outside. As such, those ways can be tolerated in the private realm, but nothing more. You may wear, you may wear a kilt if you happen to be a Scotsman. You may eat frogs if you happen to be a Frenchman. You may refrain from killing the unborn in the womb of their mother if you happen to be a Christian, but but the Ten Commandments are a particularly successful summary of this common morality. They are hardly more than a reminder of the natural law that we should not have forgotten were it not for the original sin and its aftermath in history. This is at least the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas, and it remained common knowledge for centuries. Pascal, for instance, mentions this doctrine on the example of the prohibition of murder. The gospel confirmed the law, i.e. the Torah, and the Decalogue only renewed what human beings have received from God before Moses in the person of Noah, to whom each and every human being was to be born. Let's get us, let's, let us get back to the monks. Since they never considered that their task was cultural in nature, what exactly did they do? The answer is obvious, and Pope Benedict reminds us of what is well known, but not always understood in its depth. Monks worked and prayed. The emphasis on work 
was grounded on a positive view of labor, hence of the material world, including the body and its humblest needs. This stemmed from a vision of the world as created by a good God, hence as basically good. Let me know, this is what Pope Benedict uh, what develops with a great clarity and care. Let me now emphasize the other aspect, i.e. prayer, and I will do that in the same light as Pope Benedict. Prayer is not only asking, it is praise, especially in the Psalms, which the monks were supposed to pray, are supposed to pray uh, um, each day and at each hour in the technical meaning of hour. Now, praising is the necessary consequence, hence the symptom of a complete immersion in joy. To quote once again, one last time C.S. Lewis, fully to enjoy is to glorify. We have here another kind of overflowing which is very much in keeping with a former one, the overflowing of human creative activity, which is the positive flip side of its superfluity. Now, praise has very much to do with culture. Praise used to be a basic dimension of poetry. There was in ancient literary theory a genre, said a painetic from the Greek epinos, which means exactly praise. The leading figure in this genre was Pindar. Now, some literary scholars of the ancient world went so far as to characterize poetry as essentially panegyric, that's their word of art, panegyric, i.e. laudatory, even if this poetry doesn't celebrate anybody or anything particular. Perhaps we can venture a step further and claim that praise is the nourishing milieu of art to court and of culture. You can hardly, say, paint something, be it a landscape, a portrait or what not, without an implicit avowal of the fact that it is good that there should be this landscape or this person for you to paint them. You can scarcely write a story without the basic assumption that it is interesting, even if you'll have to tell most unpleasant things. Now, in front of this definition or characterization of uh, culture as praise, uh, we may sort of examine the conscience of our present day civilization and ask ourselves, are we still able to praise? Are we still conscious of possessing something for us to praise, to thank for? Do we still have access to somebody against whom we could be thankful? What becomes culture without the praiseworthy with a capital P? Can what is worth i.e. the so-called values, be still worthwhile without a metaphysical ground. The German literary scholar Hugo Friedrich made about the Romantic movement the following observation. I quote, For the life culture of the ancient world, as well as for the ages that followed it till the 18th century, the top psychological value was joy. It was the value which showed that the wise man or the believer, the knight, the courtier, the learned man of the social elite was about to attain perfection. Sadness, whenever it was not a fleeting state of mind, was considered as a negative value. And for the theologians, it was a sin. Romanticism turned all this back to front. 
joy and serenity left the stage. They were frowned upon as commonplace, not to say ridiculously bourgeois. And they were replaced by melancholy and angst. The old sin of Acadia, the noonday devil who assaults the monk when the shades are at their shortest length, became a virtue. In other words, and in words that play on each other, I may rephrase my questions in the following way. Can culture survive where cult has no other object than the ego, him or herself? The cult of the ego was the title of a work by the late 19th and early 20th century French writer Maurice Barres. This cult has swollen into an epidemic ever since, under several names, personal development, wellness, and pursuits of that ilk. Pope Benedict is eager to point out that creativity is not enough. What happens when the only aim of culture, of art for instance, is expressing oneself, as we frequently hear. If this is the case, we need not ask whether there really is something, in, something inside of us that deserves being drawn out and shown to the audience. An Italian, Piero Manzoni, I don't know whether he was related to the Alessandro, to the great novelist, this Italian, Piero Manzoni, had the pluck to answer my question with great clarity. In May 1961, he defecated into 90 tin cans and sold them under the title of Artist Shit. <laughs> the market price for each of those cans is now around $30,000. Be Manzoni's intentions what they may have been, the fact exposed the absurdity of the idea of the artist's self-expression. If the alleged human creativity, so-called creativity, is not enough, then if there should be culture, something like an implicit faith in God's creation is required. This will be the last idea that I could elicit from Pope Benedict's speech. Pope Benedict, puts, <clears throat> Pope Benedict puts a special emphasis on song and music in monastic liturgy. First, to be sure, because of his own gift for and interest in music. But there is more to it, <clears throat> but, but there is more to it than mere personal anecdote. In the speech which I am now commenting upon, there is in the original German a passage, a matter of one half page, which was not pronounced in French. It is indeed a side issue which explains why it was left out. Saint Bernard, or the unknown author of the treatise De Cantu on singing, which is commonly ascribed to Bernard, implicitly assimilates singing out of tune to a fall in the place of dissimilitude in the Platonic Augustinian regio dissimilitudinis, place of dissimilitude, I've just translated. This <clears throat> means the loss of the divine resemblance in which Adam and all of us were created. Singing out of tune means some sort of ontological loss. On the occasion of this digression, Benedict dropped this rather weird sentence. The culture of singing is also a culture of being. At first sight, the phrase is puzzling and sounds like a tautology. How could a culture be something else than a culture of being. 
how would a culture of nothingness look like? This reminds us of another phrase by Pope Benedict's friend and predecessor on the papal throne, St. John Paul II, namely, culture of death. And again, one should ask whether every culture has not to be a culture of life, a culture of death that's self-defeating, not only as a phrase, but as a reality. In the German world, some authors pitted the culture of being against other possible forms of culture. Culture of having, culture of knowing, culture of making. In such an outlook, culture is understood as what man does. And whatever is meant under being, or the other notions that are set up against it, is only a dimension of a human. The question is whether human beings should have something, know something, make something, or simply develop what they are. This may make a great deal of sense. Yet, let me here take being seriously, i.e. in its broadest scope. In the present case, we may ask, what has singing, as an example of culture at large, to do with something like ontology, the science of being, the care for being, as its underpinning? What does ontology teach us on what culture is all about? Or conversely, what does culture teach us about being? What sort of things what sort of thing being must be, or to avoid the absurdity of the former formula, how being must be for it to have something to do with culture. What must be its relationship to culture? Is being the aim and object of a culture? Or rather its origin and ground, its nourishing soil? And you'll have guessed that this is my own answer. Singing is celebrating, is praising. Now, obviously, we can sing, hence praise, only what is good. We can move in the element of praise, which is the condition of culture, if and only if there is something praiseworthy. In the last analysis, there can be culture if and only if we are convinced that in the teeth of whatever evil is rampant, being is intrinsically good. And this is an ontological choice. This choice is presupposed in any culture grounding activity. Our task, as a conclusion, doesn't consist only in producing cultural goods, which is a necessary and highly recommendable activity. At a deeper level, however, our task consists in making culture possible in the first place by asserting the goodness of what is, by confessing something like our faith in being. And this is the last basic sense in which culture is a byproduct. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Brog. Now we have some time for a few questions. The session will be moderated by Dr. Tobias Hoffman, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the Catholic University of America, member of Crossroads and friend of Professor Brog.
Thank you for your wonderful talk, um, which did much more than uh, just comment on uh, on uh, the talk by Pope Benedict and uh, to the Bernardin, to the Collegia de Bernardin, but you showed us how it stretches even far outside of Christianity, how culture has been a byproduct even uh, um, as Aristotle describes in Egypt and then in, in the uh, Jewish tradition or in any tradition where there's a religion. So um, I was uh, particularly interested in this core, one of your core comments that uh, there's it's kind of a symbiose between uh, Christianity and culture. So you said Christianity needs culture and you documented it, how it happened historically, but also culture needs Christianity. So that leads me to my question, because obviously I, as a Christian, and am very interested in culture, because of course I, I realize that there's this need uh, for, um, for culture to live the Christian experience. And yet, and this there, I want to go to the comment, uh, to the title of your talk, Culture is a byproduct. So I'm interested in culture, and yet culture happens as a byproduct. So I cannot simply say I'm, I'm rolling up my sleeves and I'm uh, producing culture. So then, however, I can also not ignore the point that we live in a time of uncertainties, um, where I feel that I do have a task. I'm called. I'm called. Uh, I have a task in this time. Uh, so, in a certain way, how do you see my task? How do you see our task, given that culture is a byproduct, and given yeah, that, in fact, we need culture, and culture needs Christianity? Well, perhaps let me begin with enlarging uh, my own thesis. I would venture the following idea. Whatever is really interesting, whatever is really worthwhile, whatever has really a value, is, well, always a byproduct. Let me take as an example uh, the uh, idea of the pursuit of happiness. You Americans may have heard of this formula somewhere. Hmm? <laughs> and well, not to be uh, um, overly provocative, I would say the pursuit of happiness is bunk for the following reason. If we mean with pursuit of happiness, well, when I wake up in the morning, I roll up my sleeves to take up your phrase, and I tell myself, okay, you must be happy. Do whatever uh, is required for you to be happy. Forget all the rest. Aim at happiness. Hmm? This won't do. <laughs> I mean, that's a common experience. I don't have to uh, justify that. All of us know that the best way for us not to be happy is to put happy as number one of the list of our tasks. Whereas, whereas, if we will do our duty, well, the word is not uh, exactly uh, a uh, uh, favorable, a favorably accepted, not exactly a fashionable word. Uh, well, if we do our duty, uh, if we uh, uh, abide by not only the laws but the virtues, if we try to lead a an honest uh, and orderly life, happiness will come unexpectedly, perhaps unprepared as a godly surprise. Well, this is just an example, but an important one, for there are so many people who think that happiness is the thing, hmm? the thing that we must be driving at. And well, as far as our task in the present day is concerned, well, I would say very much the same thing uh, in an analogous way. We don't have to uh, tell us uh, every morning, let's do culture. Let's build a culture. 
not even a, a culture of love, to pick up the beautiful phrase launched by well, Pope uh, John Paul II, if I'm not mistaken. Let us try to do what we should. And this will build this culture of love. Let us try, well, for instance, to love each other. <laughs> the first way for us to build a culture of love is not to say, okay, let's do cultural, let's do things cultural, let's paint, let's sing, let's uh, do all kinds of highbrow activities. Let us begin at the grassroots level with love, with justice, with benevolence, and simple fair like that, you know. And, well, a culture will arise. The first question, I alluded to this at the very end of my talk, uh, when I said, uh, well, words to the effect that uh, um, a faith in the worth, a faith in the goodness of being, and I repeat, in spite, in the teeth of all appearances, for one might very well uh, look at the world uh, in a gloomy mood, and we would have good reasons for us to do that. In spite of all that, what is must be, in the last analysis, good? If we take our bearings from this most basic assumption, culture will arise, culture will grow without our having to pull on the blades of grass for them to grow more quickly. Our task is essentially a preparatory one. We have to, uh, uh, well, uh, till the soil and, well, the seeds will produce uh, the uh, trees or plants or whatever spontaneously. Thank you. We have some time for questions from the audience and there are microphones available. So, yeah, I see. Yes, please. Thank you very much for this beautiful lecture. So I'm French, you will recognize my accent, I guess. You mentioned that um, um, Christianity has nothing, nothing special to say about, about morals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to make sure that I understood what you said. Uh, when we look at the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, isn't there something spe specific for Christians to say about morals that give them a significance uh, that it wouldn't have by itself and um, isn't there a way of living Christian, uh, Christian moral life uh, which philosophers couldn't, couldn't have been able to talk about because it's specifically Christian and it's something that Aristotle or Plato wouldn't have thought about. I'm thinking about martyr or humility or poverty uh, which are virtues that were not developed or um, looked at in the same way in the, in the ancient philosophy? Well, I was expecting a question <laughs> along those lines. I'm quite conscious that my thesis has something, had something provocative about it. What I meant is what follows. Christianity, and, well, <laughs> Christianity is first and foremost what Jesus Christ did, to the best of my knowledge. He never introduced any new commandment. There is a passage in um, the, the fourth gospel, uh, John, in which he says precisely that. And now this is a scene extremely interesting if we look at it uh, through the glasses of the, <clears throat> of the audience. I will give you a new commandment says Christ. People are picking up stones in order to throw at him. This is what they should do. If they are 
abiding by the law of Moses, in which it is said that it is criminal to add or to detract anything, to add anything to or detract anything from the law of Moses. This is the sin, adding a new commandment. What is this new commandment? What follows immediately is the greatest platitude that you could imagine. A quotation, a literal quotation from Leviticus 17, 19. Love thy neighbor, which is expressed uh, in a Semitic language which does not possess uh, the uh, reciprocal pronoun. They can't say love each other. And they say love thy brother or thy neighbor or thy fellow and so on. A quotation from the Old Testament. Then people let drop <laughs> the stones <laughs> with which they wanted to, uh, which they wanted to throw at this uh, awful criminal huh, who uh, had the cheek to add something uh, to uh, Moses' law. But what comes after that is still more interesting. Love each other in the same way as the way in which I did love you. I.e., love each other as I did when I, well, anticipatorily, when I sacrificed, when, when I died for you. What is new is not the content of the commandment. What is new is the context. The context of the first commandment, the context of the Decalogue. Uh, just have a look at the, uh, the way in which the Decalogue uh, is set uh, in uh, its context in Deuteronomy. They are about to enter the Holy Land. They are about to, uh, uh, full, to, to perform uh, uh, Easter to perform the well, Pascha, uh, the, the passage uh, from uh, uh, the heathen way of life to uh, God's country. We have here a new Easter. And the new Easter gives a new context to an old command and makes it, to some extent, new, although the content of the commandment is the same. This is, the, in my opinion, the basic fact. What we call, more often, by, more often than not, by the name of Christian morals, are in fact the councils, the councils, sorry, um, yeah, it's councils, sorry, for the pronunciation, not the commandments. There are no new commandments. There, are, there is a common morality which receives different interpretations from different religious traditions. The Ten Commandments could be read, uh, let's say, in, a, uh, in an Hinduist key. If I fail to abide by those commandments, I will make my karma... Hmm, uh, um, Mm, I will load my karma. I will let my karma plunge. You can interpret them in the key uh, of Islam. I will displease God. I will disobey him. You can interpret them in the key of, uh, let's say, uh, a pagan aristocratic ethics. I will do what a gentleman or a kalokagathos is not supposed to do. And you can interpret this in a Christian key, i.e., I will lack love. But the content is the same. The content is the same. Let's say the, the mood or the, the color or whatnot uh, is hugely different. And for this reason, there is no Christian morals, but there is a Christian way to be moral. Hi, my name is Henry. Thank you so much for the talk. It's fantastic. I hope I can get a copy of it later from my friends. <laughs> uh, 
you actually sparked an idea in me that, which I want to bounce off of you. Uh, because I, I'm kind of struck by this ontological passivity that you're alluding to. So, would if I took your theory further, could I say that culture is the byproduct of the space between the faith in the goodness of being and silence in front of that being? Did you say silence or yes. science? Silence. Silence. Yeah, a silence born, I guess, from the awe in front of that being. Uh, well, it would be interesting to uh, try to get a clear idea of what silence is about on the basis of the understanding of singing that I suggested. You know, there is no uh, no sound is possible without silence. No music is possible without a right way uh, to put. Uh, silences between the sounds. There is a beautiful saying by a uh, well fellow countryman of mine who was not a musician but a painter. And he had almost the same surname as my humble self, Georges Braque, not with a G but with a Q. And he said, uh, um, the, um, the vase, a, a, a jar, a jug, or something like that, gives a form to the void. And music gives a form to silence. What is most important in music might be the silence as the, uh, silence as the backdrop on which, uh, uh, well, it becomes possible. And perhaps I could adapt this idea, well, in my way, by saying that uh, no culture, no uh, culture creating activity is possible but, uh, without, uh, well, the silent contemplation of what is. If you really look at something, well, you must shut up. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, but quite concretely, when we really admire, ah, uh, that way. Huh? Uh, you must stare uh, and remain uh, uh, well, yawning <laughs> uh, in, in some, to some extent uh, before uh, what you look at and what you will admire. Huh? Uh, no culture without uh, this element of admiration which uh, uh, puts uh, a stopper on our big mouth, uh, in contradistinction to the eternal chat uh, and to the, uh, well, you know, Pascal said the eternal silence of those infinite spaces frightens me. And well, <laughs> from time to time, I, uh, I must say, where the eternal chat of those confined spaces uh, is unbearable. I hate this. Uh, well, in a restaurant, you can't uh, get silence. You know, silence is becoming uh, the most expensive of all wares. Well, perhaps it would be good from time to time to listen to what Cardinal Sarah uh, said in his most recent book, which is precisely about the worth and uh, need. Uh, of silence. And well, in, uh, I won't have to answer your question. Uh, I'll content myself with a, uh, with a word, i.e. right on. Hmm. Well, since you said that there is a specific Christian context and flavor for morality. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there is a specific Christian flavor and context for culture. Well, it should be very much the same thing, mm -hmm. i.e. culture not understood as a uh, way for us to uh, uh, 
uh, strut about uh, with our achievements, not a way uh, for us to uh, show uh, how big screaming deals we are, but uh, a cult of sorts, uh, we should not hesitate, uh, I guess, uh, to uh, use uh, this uh, uh, word which has an obvious uh, religious uh, connotation. Uh, culture as cult. Culture as admiration. Culture as uh, bringing about in us a humility of sorts. When we listen to great music, when we look at great painting, well, we feel small, and this is quite a positive feeling. We are not crushed by uh, this feeling of our, well, uh, inferiority. There is this wonderful uh, sentence by Goethe, yeah. that's uh, in the Wahlverwandtschaften, <laughs> Elective Affinities, Affinities, I think. Okay, the, the, in one of his novels, there is in the diary of uh, one of the female characters um, the following sentence that I'm trying first to remember uh, in the original, and then I'll try to translate it. Um, um, well, vis-à-vis uh, -vis, um, excessive superiority. Uh, the only remedy is love. When somebody or something is hugely superior to us, we could experience resentment, envy, jealousy, all kind of negative feelings. And the only way out the only way upwards is love, admiration, gratitude. We must be grateful towards the existence of uh, this superior uh, work of art or person or achievement and so on and so forth. Together, we are feeling grateful towards if we happen, if we have the luck to be a believer, will be grateful towards well, the creator of all beauty, the creator of all greatness. This might be the only way out. And if we don't uh, do that, uh, we'll uh, have sort of to indulge uh, in uh, hatred and uh, still worse, in envy. We will tell us uh, how is it that I could not do that? How is it that I am not as good, as clever, as bad, and so on and so forth? Love is the solution, so to, so to speak. Can see. Professor, I would like to know uh, if you've given any thought to the influence of relative, relativism upon our Western culture, as well as its effect upon our sense or degree of faith today. Uh, yeah, oh yes. Yes, I would like to know if you have given any thought to the influence of relativism uh -huh. as a phys philosophical thought upon our Western culture, as well as our uh, mm -hmm. sense okay. or degree no, of I, faith I, I had today. Heard you. I had heard you. I couldn't see you, but I could hear you. Well, th th thank you for Well, I like to, to see the face of people who, with whom I'm speaking, uh, which is quite a common experience. Um, well, In a word, where there are so many people for whom relativism at present is supposed to be the, well, the, the arch-villain uh, in the plot of the movie. Yeah. 
relativism, uh, meaning that uh, there is no nothing absolute, uh, nothing that has a worth in itself, and uh, well, as a consequence, that everything has to be sort of submitted to uh, our whims. Uh, the snag being that uh, my whims are not your whims and a third person will have another way for uh, him or her to uh, uh, evaluate things. This is for the most part uh, what is meant with uh, rel relativism and what is aimed at uh, by uh, the critique, by the often leveled critique uh, against uh, relativism. Well, perhaps we should qualify this uh, uh, attitude and try to uh, uh, look at the positive sides of relativism, for there are such sides. It might be another notion of relativism that the one which is aimed at, for instance, in uh, uh, Pope Benedict's uh, utterances about this theme, in which he says that relativism is uh, something uh, uh, that we could uh, try and stave off from our uh, culture. Uh, relativism uh, can mean that we are not the absolute. And in this, uh, in this meaning, uh, relativism uh, is something healthy. Our opinion, our interests, our uh, doings, and so on and so forth, are not necessarily the best thing that can exist. But there is a far cry between this modest, this prudent attitude toward, uh, towards oneself on the one hand and the uh, will for us to drag whatever well, possess, possesses a value down to uh, the level on which uh, things can be exchanged uh, the one for the other. And well, with this, uh, if I may add this rider to the critique of relativism, uh, I think we could have it both ways, i.e. first as a useful uh, implement against ourselves, against our perhaps almost, well, I was about to say natural, but we are fallen beings. Um, I mean, our nature uh, was corrupted. It would be an implement against an overly uh, confidence uh, in our fallen nature and in its choices on the one hand. And on the other hand, well, we should relativize ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the values which we stand for. This is the same gesture, you know, we acknowledge the superiority of an ideal or even of the realization of this ideal and we relativize ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the superiority of this ideal. And by this token, I come back to what I've just been saying, i.e. <laughs> love is sort of a way for us to relativize ourselves, to realize that we are not that fantastic that we have to learn. This is the first uh, uh, stance necessary in order for us to build a culture. We have to learn, we have to admire, we have to acknowledge, we have to confess the uh, goodness of being, and so on and so forth. All this uh, is kind of a relativism, certainly not the one uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, felt the flack in uh, uh, Pope Benedict's uh, encyclica.
Uh, um, yeah, Archbishop. Well, thank you for an excellent um, inaugural lecture in memory of Monsignor Lorenzo. My question is, um, given or if culture is a byproduct, what is, it's a byproduct of the human experience, mm -hmm. what is of the essence, if anything, of the human experience? What, what is of the essence? Mm -hmm. If culture is a byproduct, mm -hmm. then what is of the essence of the human experience, if anything? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that's a taller order <laughs> than what was <laughs> proposed to me uh, in uh, uh, Angelo Sala's uh, email. Where the, uh, no. This is not a cop out, you know. I really feel the, the the challenge. Well, you can't hardly uh, claim, uh, can't hardly ask for a full fledged definition of human culture. But let me perhaps get back to. Uh, the uh, two uh, points of departure, one in Athens, one in Jerusalem, i.e. Aristotle telling us that uh, science and philosophy at large uh, could arise because the, uh, the Egyptian priests could uh, twiddle their thumbs after the cultic acts so in order not to get stiff bored, they had to invent uh, intellectual pursuits, not only games, but, well, geometry and other kinds of, uh, intellect, of highly uh, uh, interesting intellectual pursuits on the one hand. On the other hand, we have this uh, idea that idolatry, uh, idolatry uh, is... Uh, well, what is left, or it, the, the idol is quite concretely made of what is left of the wood that was used in order to warm our bodies, to cook our meals, and possibly uh, to uh, uh, give uh, our eyes uh, some pleasure. And well, if we look at the common point of those two uh, rather different worldviews from different contexts, uh, we'll see that there is in human nature something like an excess. The ability to do more than what, we should, what is strictly necessary. The ability to go beyond uh, the satisfaction of our basic needs. An ability that can be uh, given vent to in the creation of idols, and this is the bad side, which uh, uh, um, Isaiah, uh, the prophet, is criticizing. But there is quite a good side to it, the openness, the openness to, uh, well, the whole spectrum of possibilities, the openness to the question about the origin of what is there. This is what Aristotle alluded to when he um, understood philosophy as uh, looking after the causes. How is it that things are what they are? All this points towards, well, the essence of, uh, of, of uh, human culture, i.e., what I should call, for want of uh, any better word, excess. Mm -hmm. um, well, if we uh, look for a more bombastic uh, formula, uh, we'll have to translate this into Latin and speak of transcendence. 
the uh, ability uh, for us to transcend ourselves, to uh, be our own ladder and to climb uh, on ever higher rungs of this ladder in the direction of well, good or evil, idol or God. Thank you, and I thank everybody.